Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our webinar today. Um, I'm Tom Glensky, Chief Inspector with the Board of Pharmacy. Uh, joining me later on will be Kimberly Grinston, our Executive Director. She'll join me later on when we do question and answers. Um, today's topic for the webinar is an update on COVID-19 and how, um, especially the um, expiration of the pharmacy waivers, how that is impacting uh, the practice of pharmacy. Before we get started with the webinar, um, I'll go through some just general slides. If you haven't been on our webinars before, um, you are in um, listen-only mode. If you have any trouble um, with audio, um, connecting through the computer audio, there is a telephone option. If you go to the webinar, uh, the go to webinar toolbar, you and go under the audio section, you will see um, the uh, options to dial in. Uh, this uh, program has been approved for one hour of CE. Um, you must be signed in under your own username to get credit. You can't share um, usernames and try to get credit for multiple people. The, um, I'll go over more CE and instructions at the end on how to get CE. And just a reminder that you need to save your certificates. Um, we, the board does not report to the CPE monitor. Um, if you're looking for handouts, there's two options for you. You can go to the board's website on the left side um, under the upcoming events tab. If you click that, there's an announcement for the webinar and underneath that is a link for um, handouts today. Or you can go to your go to webinar toolbar, um, open the little handout section shown here on the screen and underneath that will be a PDF um, of today's handouts. We do record the webinar um, and post it on our website along with all our past um, webinars. And there's a list of what we did, some of what we did last year. If time permitting, we, we hope to be able to answer some questions at the end of the webinar. If you'd like to submit a question to us, go to your toolbar um, under the questions section, type in your question and hit send. You can do it anytime throughout the webinar or at the end during the question and answer session. So we'll go ahead and get started now. Um, this, some of the main topics we're, I'm gonna talk about today is the expiration of the waivers and how that's affecting the practice of pharmacy and what board, actions the board has taken to help alleviate some of the problems um, that the expiration has caused. I'm going to specifically talk about how um, the expiration has affected vaccines and COVID-19 therapeutics. Um, we're also going to talk a little about, about the oral therapeutics, some questions and issues that have come up around that. And then um, throughout there, there's some other um, topics, um, minor topics I'm going to talk about shortly. And then at the end, again, we'll see if we can have a question and answer session. So what happened on 12-31, the um, governor did not extend the state of emergency. The state of emergency, uh, because of that, the waivers that the governor had granted to various state agencies also expired. The Board of Pharmacy had a variety of waivers throughout the pandemic. Um, some were um, didn't get renewed back earlier this uh, spring of 21, but we, again, we'd still had a variety of waivers um, in effect um, at the end of December, those waivers did not um, get renewed. Um, the people ask, why was there such short notice of this? The board did not find out about officially that the waivers, were, uh, the state of emergency was not being extended until it was the afternoon of um, the 30th. The board called an emergency um, call the next morning to go over that, and then the board um, issued guidance later that morning on the 31st. Um, that guidance document is, um, is a link to it here. If you have the handouts, that should be able to click that and take you to that document. And that document just kind of summarized the effects of the waivers going away on different aspects of vaccine and therapeutics and some other issues. So just to kind of briefly go over what those what waivers have expired. Um, there was a waivers to that allow you to use a protocol with the Missouri physician to administer COVID-19 uh, childhood vaccines, and then also the COVID-19 therapeutics. 
Uh, there was a waiver that would allow um, non-resident pharmacists and technicians who did not hold a Missouri license to be able to come into Missouri and work at Missouri pharmacies. There was a waiver that would allow um, a non-licensed, non-resident pharmacy to be in a Class J shared service arrangement with the Missouri uh, pharmacy. Um, there was a waiver that allowed technicians who are located in another state to perform remote data entry. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. There was um, a waiver um, that allowed the um, aseptic technique skilled assessment to be from another facility to be used in case of emergency. So if hospital needed to move um, employee around for staffing, they, they would not have to go through the um, full assessment um, at the new facility. Other waivers, um, there was one that, um, that allowed you to substitute non-equivalent albuterol inhalers. Um, the emergency dispensing statute um, was increased to 60 day supply. Uh, there was a waiver that allowed uh, Missouri pharmacies to be in class J, shared services, perform those things without a class J license on their permit. Um, there was waiver that um, allowed pharmacies who needed to compound certain drugs for hospitalized patients um, that would allow them to follow the FDA temporary guidance um, that was issued on that. And then there was also a waiver that allowed hospitals to distribute non-patient specific uh, compounds um, to in specific instances. So all those have, have gone away. Um, what the board did to alleviate some of this, um, yesterday during the board's meeting, they approved um, the filing of two emergency rules. Um, the first one would be to allow, as I mentioned earlier, the use of aseptic technique skills assessment from other facilities in, in emergency situations. And the other one um, would be allow um, Missouri licensed technicians located in another state to be able to perform um, remote data entry. Uh, the board, board has a rule currently on, on this topic that prohibits um, technicians to be located outside of Missouri. The board did um, previously approve amending that rule to allow it at them to be licensed in any state. That, is, that amendment is going through the official um, rulemaking process, so it won't be finalized um, probably for another three, four months possibly. So the board um, wanted to speed that up and decided to go forward with that same language as an emergency rule. So before these would be emergency rules would be effective, uh, the board has to get them approved and they have to be filed with the Secretary of State. So it, it will be a little while before they are. Um, so watch for e-alerts for updates. We will notify um, um, people through through that when we um, have them filed and they are effective. Other board action, the board um, is going to align with the uh, federal temporary policy that they issued back um, in 2020 that um, it's specific for co pharmacies compounding for hospitalized patients. Um, it dealt mainly with allowing them to do non-patient, I mean, non-patient specific compounding and also com compounding of commercially available products. Um, it is limited. That guidance has um, um, specifics that you have to do to do it, and it only applied to certain drugs. So the board will align with that and allow pharmacies to continue to do that. Um, but if you are interested in that, you, you do need to um, pull that up and, and review that. Um, temporary policy. Throughout today's program, I, I talk about the HHS PrEP Act. Um, this act has been amended 10 times during the, the pandemic. Uh, the last amendment was last week on the 7th. So whenever I'm referring to this, I'm referring to the most recent addendum, the 10th Amendment. And so if, if you need to look up anything in that, make sure you're pulling up the 10th Amendment so you have the most current uh, version of that. 
So we'll talk about the effects um, of the waivers going away and how that affects. Um, first, we'll talk about the COVID-19 vaccine. Um, you mean with the waiver going away that allowed you to use a protocol that's no longer allowed. So you no longer have the option to use a protocol with the Missouri physician to administer the COVID-19 vaccine. Currently, the options you have available are the PREP Act, which gives pharmacists the um, authority to um, do that on their own. Um, the state has, the Department of Health has issued statewide standing orders that pharmacists can use to administer that. And then, um, not that it's probably being used by very many people, but uh, administration by medical prescription order um, is out there and would be an option too. So I'm gonna talk about each of those separately now. So the PrEP Act authority allows, uh, says pharmacists may order and administer the COVID-19 vaccine. It, it also says interns and technicians may administer it. Um, if you're doing this and a prescription needs to be created for whatever reason, the pharmacist is the prescriber on that prescription. And then for, you need to follow all the PrEP Act requirements. So this is why you need to go to the PrEP Act and make sure you understand what those requirements are. And that including, including the training requirements for the pharmacist and the interns. Um, those do vary from what the board requires. Um, but I, the, um, in, for the case of technicians, the board has more stringent requirements, but for the PREP Act, these um, board of pharmacy requirements do not apply. So the technicians who are administering the COVID-19 vaccine do not have to be certified. They do not need one year experience and they do not have to go through the initial and ongoing competency assessments. So again, the PREP Act, uh, the pharmacists themselves are ordering and administering it under their own authority given to them by the PREP Act. Next is the um, Department of Health statewide standing orders. There's a link to it here. Um, they currently have um, four different standing orders. Um, there's one for each of the vaccines and then in Pfizer, it's broken down into two uh, based on what age group you're looking at. So you can find those um, standing orders on this link here at the Department of Health's website. Um, the standing orders allows pharmacists, interns, and technicians to administer. They have to be in compliance with the PREP Act. So they need to, again, this falls back on the PREP Act. Um, Dr. Terbalizi, that's um, who is a physician that is on those standing orders, is the prescriber whenever a prescription has to be generated for this. You need to review and follow the standing order requirements. And then again, uh, you follow the PREP Act requirements, including training. Uh, you do not have to follow the board uh, requirements for technicians, the three things I listed here again. So there was some discrepancies in the standing, or there still is in the standing orders. Um, the wording is not the same in all of them. And in particular, the Pfizer age five to 11 standing order has some uh, language in it that the other three do not have, and it has to do with um, some training uh, requirements. Um, there is an attachment A in the Pfizer 5 to 11. Uh, we did clarify with the Department of Health that even though that attachment talks about training for pharmacists and interns and technicians, that attachment does not apply um, to pharmacists, interns, and technicians. So you do not need to be concerned about attachment A. Attachment A um, had some older language early on in the pandemic when um, the PREP Act um, put a specific hour a number on training. It had to be a 20-hour program. Um, that was later changed in the PREP Act, and it was only 20 hours if your state didn't already have training requirements, which we do. So again, um, if you see the, that in the Pfizer age five to 11, you, you do not need to be concerned with attachment A. Because these are the Department of Health standing orders, um, any questions about them need to be directed to the Department of Health. They do have a special email address for, for um, the COVID vaccine, and that is where you would want to send questions if you had any about the standing orders. 
So a pharmacist, as I mentioned, can also do it by medical prescription order. This would be what you've had the authority to do uh, with other vaccines and drugs for um, quite a while now under the board, but it would apply to the COVID-19 vaccine too. Uh, if a prescriber wrote a prescription for it, you could administer it based on that. Uh, you must comply with um, the board's rules on that, except you, you can choose to follow the PREP Act training requirements instead of the board's. So again, the three technician requirements that the board requires, um, you could choose not to follow those for your technicians um, for the COVID-19 vaccine. Um, whatever, uh, if you're doing vac the vaccine by prescription order, you, you must follow FDA emergency youth authorization and, or CDC guidelines, whichever ones um, uh, are in effect for whatever uh, manufacturer you're using. So next we'll move on from the COVID to uh, influenza and um, just explain why you'll see in my program influenza is is broken into age 19 and above and then 3 to 18 and the reason that is is because that's how the PREP Act um, it breaks it down. Um, they have a special section for influenza vaccine for ages 19 plus and then they have a section in the PREP Act for childhood vaccines which would cover uh, influenza food through age 3 to 18. Uh, so for the flu vaccine, uh, ages 19 and above, there is no statewide standing order. Um, there never was one for pharmacists. Um, the available options for you are the PREP Act authority that we kind of talked about already, administration by protocol. That's normally prior to pandemic, what you were using, most of you using to, um, to give influenza vaccine to adults. And then again, a medical by medical prescription order is an option. So just to refresh at the PrEP Act, pharmacists may order and administer um, influenza vaccine. Interns and technicians may administer it. Um, when a prescription needs to be created under the PrEP Act, the pharmacist is the prescriber. And again, uh, you, um, you, you do not have to technique, you have to follow the PREP Act requirements, including training, but you do not, technicians do not have to meet the board's three additional requirements for influenza age 18, for age 19 and above. And then uh, influenza by protocol, again, you, you can do it by protocol or medical prescription order. You would follow the board's one of the two rules, whichever one applies to the method you're doing. And again, you may choose to follow the PREP Act training requirements for your technicians, and the three bullets there would not apply. Childhood vaccines, and again, this is how the PREP Act um, lists them, ages 3 to 18. So this would be any vaccine that the CDC um, recommends for, for anyone in the age of 3 to 18. It does include influenza. There is no statewide standing order for childhood vaccines. So similar, your available options are the PrEP Act by protocol or by uh, medical prescription order. So the PrEP Act, similar to what we just said for the flu, uh, for 19 and above, same thing applies. Pharmacists can order and administer, interns and technicians can administer. Pharmacist again is the prescriber and um, you follow PREP Act requirements and the board's three extra requirements for technicians would not apply. Now by protocol is a little tricky on this one. Um, you can use a protocol for ages seven and above um, and, and limited to the vaccines allowed by statute. So the vaccines that are listed here are combinations of those you can give by protocol if they're a childhood vaccine, um, you can use the, uh, the, the, um, the, the protocol authority to do that, but it's, it's only age seven. So there is a gap in what the PREP Act allows um, from ages three to up to seven. The PREP Act gives you more authority than what a, using a protocol would do. For uh, You need to follow the board's um, protocol rule, which is 6.050. 
And again, um, you have the option of choosing um, to follow PREP Act training requirements for your technicians if you choose. And then again, um, medical prescription order could be uh, used for this. Um, you have to follow, I mean, it can be used for any childhood vaccines and patients uh, per ages per CDC recommendations. You've got to stay within CDC recommendations when you're doing vaccines under medical prescription order. Um, in this case, you'll follow the rule 6.040. And again, uh, you may choose to follow PREP Act training requirements. So here's just kind of, for those that like to see it visually, here's a breakdown of what you can use for what age group. Um, PREP Act is seven to uh, 18. Protocol would be, um, no, PREP Act is three to 18. Protocol is seven uh, to 18 for those uh, vaccines allowed by statute. And then RX order would be the whole range there if it's recommended by CDC. So all, all other vaccines um, that we didn't mention here, um, board requirements would apply to those. You would follow the two board rules depending on what order, uh, what method you are using. And these would include technicians needing to be certified, one-year experience, and competency assessments. So just um, shingles vaccine would fall under this, pneumonia for uh, people um, over a, uh, age 19 and above, um, any of the other vaccines you're doing uh, for adults would all um, fall under this. And this is what you have been doing prior to the pandemic. So there really is no, no change here other than during the pandemic, the board did uh, change the rule to allow technicians to administer with some additional requirements for them. So this just summarizes kind of what I went through earlier in a, in a chart of where you get your authority to administer. And, um, um, and then for um, protocol for the childhood vaccine, it does, it's not full authority. It depends on the age and what vaccine you're doing. And I talked a lot about technician requirements uh, just previously. So I put that in a chart here to try to give it um, to see uh, how it applies to what method you're doing and what would apply. And then this is just a summary of technician requirements uh, per the PREP Act. Um, there's, theirs is not as specific as the board. It just says it needs to be an ACPE training program. Um, and one of the things it must include hands-on injection technique training and then they must have a current CPR certification. Um, are, there is no um, hour requirement on this ACB training program since Missouri has um, requirements already in place. Um, the PREP Act talks about a 20 hour program um, for, um, in some cases, um, but that would not apply here um, to our technicians. And then when the board's requirements, um, we require an ACPE or a, a program that was put on by a pharmacy or medical school or one that has been officially approved by the board. And it, it must include live in-person training assessment. And again, the board does not have any type of um, minimum hour requirement uh, for that program. The board requires um, a CPR or a BLS cer certification. And then the three bullets here, um, this is um, the technician has to have an active technician certification. They must have initial and annual competency assessment. And then in order to administer, they must have one year experience as a licensed technician, but that experience doesn't have to be in Missouri. It can fr come from any state. Okay, some other allowances in the PREP Act I want to call out to you is the PREP Act still allows um, pharmacists and interns licensed in other states um, may administer COVID-19 or flu vaccines in any state. So uh, we still they still can come into Missouri without a Missouri license and do it under that authority. And then um, the pharmacists and interns 
with expired or lapsed good standing license within the last five years may administer a COVID vaccine in any state. So if a pharmacist who um, let their license lapse within the fa last five years, if they were um, in good standing when that occurred, um, they could administer COVID vaccine without a license. Um, however, there are some other requirements. You need to go back to the PrEP Act. Um, to look at the, what's required for both of these two bullets. Uh, the board does ask that anybody who is unlicensed that is practicing in Missouri fill out an emergency practice notification form um, and that's found out found on our website. The board did issue some guidance on uh, the use of non-pharmacy healthcare providers, mainly nurses. Um, we get, have, over the years had lots of questions about using nurses to help administer vaccines in the in pharmacies. Um, during the pandemic, the board issued guidance on how that could be done for the COVID-19 vaccine. And then in December, um, I have the wrong date there. It should be year. It should be 2021. News alert. The board um, expanded that to any vaccine. Um, I'm not going to go over this. It, you can pull this document up by the link on, or it's on our website. Um, and if you have questions about that, you could contact your inspector or me um, if you had questions on how that can be done. We're going to move on now to the therapeutics. Um, the, the way with the expiration of the waivers, you can no longer use a protocol um, in order to administer a therapeutic. Um, the Department of Health does have, um, I believe it's three standing orders for monoclonal antibody treatment. Um, however, when they originally issued those, they, they said those did not apply to pharmacists. So your available options are the PrEP Act authority or do, doing it under medical prescription order. So under PrEP Act authority, it says pharmacists may order and administer, but it, it applies only to oral, sub-Q, or, or IM routes. Uh, it did not include infusion therapies. Um, the two oral uh, drugs, their emergency use authorization specifically say that a, uh, pharmacists aren't allowed to prescribe it, um, that. So, um, you were really down to basically just uh, sub-Q and IM routes. Um, and due to the new variant, uh, I don't know if we're seeing much of that going on, those therapies, those routes being used. Um, the PrEP Act did say interns and technicians may administer um, therapeutics. And then if any prescription would be needed, um, pharmacists would be the prescriber on those prescriptions. And then similar to vaccines, you follow the PrEP Act requirements, including training. And again, um, if a technician needs to administer, you, they did not need to follow the board's um, um, requirement, three bullets there of additional requirements. So medical prescription order would cover the sub-QIM and the infusion route. So it would be um, allowed that a pharmacist um, could do start an infusion. This is assumed they're properly trained to do that. Um, they need to follow um, the board's rule on medical prescription order, um, except um, they can choose the PrEP Act training requirements for sub-Q or IM routes. So um, you can do that, but because the PrEP Act um, does not include the in infusions, um, for any pharmacist who wanted to do infusion, they would have to follow the board's uh, requirements on training for that. And just a refresher on that, uh, the board added this a few years ago that for routes that weren't covered in your normal um, training program, which normally those were IM and uh, sub-Q administrations, that they would allow pharmacists to administer in other routes if they went out and got training by a licensed health care practitioner um, who is authorized to administer by those routes. So again, um, this would be how a pharmacist would be able to do that. We've had lots of questions come in recently about the oral uh, therapeutics. 
Um, we, um, they're, they're in very short supply right now. I heard recently that the state's probably only getting about a thousand of, of um, their uh, treatments, um, courses of treatment a, a week on these. So they're very limited right now. But we've had lots of questions about um, how that would be, um, how it could be dispensed and distributed. So I wanted to go through that here. So um, as I mentioned earlier, the, the EUAs for these two uh, drugs um, do not allow pharmacists to prescribe it. Uh, but you can dispense it just like you would any other prescription. And so that's what we would see be going on um, with these two drugs. Lots of questions from hospitals. Since hospitals are the entities who are receiving um, the oral therapeutics. And so uh, I just want to go over how, how can a hospital provide these to the patient. So if being dispensed by pharmacists for administration outside of the licensed health premises, Board of Pharmacy requirements would apply. So uh, you would need a permit with the, a pharmacy license with the board and follow our dispensing uh, requirements, um, labeling, record keeping, and all the rest, just like you would do for any other, um, say, an employee prescription if you do those. For clinics that the hospitals has that are outside the licensed premises of the hospital, um, practitioners there, doctors, uh, physicians, nurse practitioner, uh, PAs, uh, may dispense to their own patients under their own board's requirements. So um, they have that authority. Again, it's limited just to their own patients that they see, um, but they have the ability to do that. Um, but again, you would need to refer to their board's requirements on how that's done. And then the Department of Health um, hospital uh, pharmacy rule does allow for non-pharmacy dispensing from the ED or to patients on discharge. And so here's, here's the rule um, right there. And it says persons other than pharmacists may provide these meds under certain circumstances. The patient has to be a registered patient of the ED or is being discharged from the hospital. And then there's other requirements in this rule. And then one of them is pharmacy services um, have, can't be available. And then if they're not, there's a supply limit that put on that. But the rule does allow an exemption from those um, when it's in the best interest of the patient or uh, public health. And so the department has said that they believe um, providing COVID-19 oral therapeutics to patients would meet that exemption. So it would allow um, the ED or patients on discharge, even if the pharmacy is open or a pharmacy in the community is open, it would allow those um, to, to be given out by the ED um, or uh, on discharge by someone other than the pharmacist. They wouldn't have to go to the, be, to the pharmacy to be dispensed um, by the pharmacy. So that opens up an, an avenue and it also allows full course therapy to be given out. The whole five days worth can be given out regardless of when pharmacy services are available with that exemption. So if, if you're interested in that, you, you need to review that whole rule because there's talking about labeling and some other things in there in that section. And because this is a Department of Health rule, questions about that should be sent to the Department of Health. Um, here is an email address that is a, uh, special for the um, hospital um, licensing section of, at the department that you can use. We have lots of questions about redistribution of the oral therapeutics. Um, the, um, we had a discussion with health and they told us that the, the, if you are, if you receive, if your hospital receives these, they are intended to be used within your health system or organization. Um, is that um, you're not supposed to be redistributing them outside of that. So um, besides hospitals, FQHCs, um, I understand have been receiving some of the oral therapeutics too. So you may distribute them to pharmacies and clinics within your system and organizations, but the Department of Health says you should not be distributing them outside of your organization. Um, we have had some inquiries for far hospitals that weren't um, set up or weren't licensed to dispense to patients, um, would it be possible for them to like 
get linked up with a local community pharmacy to do it for them and supply the drug to them. And according to health, that would not be allowed. Should you do need to distribute um, throughout um, your system, there, there is an exemption for um, these two drugs under some of our uh, drug distributor language that it would not require a, a border license, distributor license. Um, that, and that would apply to, um, let's say, um, if your clinics downstream needed to distribute it to another clinic directly, that, that could be done without a board of pharmacy drug distributor license. But that's specific for these um, drugs that fall under the emergency use authorization. COVID testing, um, we, we still get questions about that. Um, the PrEP Act says pharmacists may order and administer um, testing. Interns and technicians may administer the test too. Um, if a prescription had to be created for that, um, the pharmacist would be the prescriber. Um, you would follow PrEP Act requirements um, on that. The board um, in their guidance document, the link here below, has a section on COVID testing. And it has in there, it has links to um, HHS issued some guidance statements throughout the pandemic um, that talk about these here and um, these the testing in there. So that's that's where you would find um, what the requirements are for that. And so there are links to that in the board's guidance statement. Now we've had um, we've been brought to our attention now that the federal government says that insurance companies will will be reimbursing for um, the testing. There's been questions about how that's going to be done. Uh, I don't I don't know how that would be done, but it was brought up. Um, you know, if far, if a prescription is going to be involved. Um, is there any standing order that could be used for that? Currently, there, I'm not aware of a standing order that could be used for pharmacists to prescribe these um, under a standing order. I know there was some discussion um, with um, some people in the industry with the Department of Health on the need for a possible standing order, but um, I haven't heard um, of one being issued yet. Um, if one would get issued, we would uh, notify people uh, via our um, e-alert system. So um, if you're not signed up for those, um, you should sign up for our alerts. And then one last thing, just um, this is a renewal year. We did have a waiver for the previous renewal back in 2020 that lowered the um, CE requirement to 15 hours. Um, that waiver expired earlier in 2021. Um, so for the 2022 renewal, um, it is 30 hours of CE. They will have to be, it have to be earned between November 1st of 2020 and October 31st of this year. We get lots of questions about, can it just be 30 hours anytime during that, or does it have to be 15 hours per year in there? So the answer is it's 30 hours um, just anytime during that period. You don't have to have 15 the first year and 15 the second. Okay, so we should have, we got time now for some questions. Um, if you'd like to send us questions, go to your toolbar, type them in, and um, send them to us. Uh, give me a minute to... Tom, um, good afternoon, everyone. This is Kimberly Grinston. While you're looking at questions, um, there are a couple of questions came, that came in that I wanted to answer. <clears throat> Someone is asking about technicians working remotely outside of Missouri. They wanted to confirm that um, an emergency rule is in the approval process, and that is correct. Currently, with the expiration of the waiver, technicians cannot perform or can only perform remote data entry activities from a Missouri location. The board on yesterday approved an emergency rule to allow non-Missouri locations, however, that emergency rule needs to be submitted to the governor's office and also go through the emergency rulemaking process. That process can take up to two to three weeks. So as Tom mentioned earlier, please monitor the board's website and e-alerts um, for updates on that. Someone else is asking, if you have an existing physician protocol to administer COVID vaccines, um, do you need to formally terminate or rescind that protocol? Our law doesn't require 
our meaning the Board of Pharmacy's law doesn't require that you officially terminate or rescind that protocol, but you do need to know that Missouri law does not allow you to use that protocol for COVID-19 vaccines. So if you added it to your flu protocol or another protocol, we are not requiring that you go back and amend your protocol again to remove COVID-19 vaccines, but every pharmacist, everyone who is a party to the protocol um, should understand that you cannot use a protocol right now to administer COVID-19 vaccines. Looks like we got a question um, about um, FQH, FQHC pharmacies. Um, can they use the COVID therapeutics um, on any patients, is, or is it just patients that are seen at their health center? Um, I, I don't. The board cannot answer that. The Department of Health is in charge of the distribution and the use of these drugs. So um, you can, um, you would have to send your email, um, send an email to them and ask that question. They do have a special um, email address. Um, that you can send it to, and I will send the asker that that question after the, that email after the webinar if I can't find it before we get off. Someone is asking, can a pharmacist give COVID vaccines at a citywide event such as um, St. Louis City? Yes, um, Missouri law does allow pharmacists to administer COVID-19 vaccines at a non-pharmacy location. Good question. Someone's asking about the billing of the oral th therapeutics. Um, can we bill insurance? Um, my understanding that those are being provided free. You can't bill for the, um, the drug itself, but um, I don't know about a dispensing fee. Um, I think you need to ask the Department of Health and then you also probably need to ask whatever agency you're billing, such as Medicaid. Um, or, or Part D or private insurance. Someone has asked if there are any updates on the waivers referring to telehealth and prescribers being required to be licensed in Missouri. I, the Board of Pharmacy, we don't have any updates. We would encourage you to contact the Board of Healing Arts and or the Board of Nursing, depending on the prescriber. Someone's asking about the emergency rule. Um, on the shared media skills assessment, which includes the media field, is that going to be a permanent rule? Yes, the board is filing it as an emergency and a permanent revision. I will tell you, it is limited just to emergency situations. It's not a true, um, um, it, it just covers emergency situations. When the board does uh, look at the sterile compounding rule again, and they're planning and doing that after seven, chapter 797 is finalized. Um, there has been discussion about um, allowing that to happen um, across the board. Um, but at this time, that, that emergency rule is just limited to emergency situations when a pharmacy would need to do that. More questions on billing. Uh, the board really can't give billing advice out. Uh, they want to know um, about using um, Dr. Turbulizi as the prescriber. Um, you can do that for COVID vaccine because there is a standing order for COVID vaccine, but there is no standing order for any other vaccine. So um, you couldn't you couldn't do that and your question about Missouri Medicaid, about um, paying pharmacists uh, as the prescriber, you need to talk to Missouri Medicaid um, with your, your question about that. Someone is asking if the presentation would be, is going to be available on the board's website and it will. Yeah, they're asking about the, the power. The PowerPoint itself, the, the handouts of the slides are, and then there's a will be a recording of it. Um, we will have available um, eventually. Someone is asking if the changes to the technician rule does it only affect data entry, or or does it also affect other remote work? 
Um, under our rule right now, technicians, um, our rule only allows remote data entry from a, a outside of a pharmacy. Technicians are authorized to assist with, assist with vaccines out of, outside of a pharmacy. Um, but our rule only addresses remote data entry. We got a question about um, replacing lost vaccination cards. Um, the, we want to know the board's position on that. The board doesn't have a position on that. I would refer you to the Department of Health um, on, on what they recommend um, on that. We got another question about using Dr. Terbalizi. Uh, yes, he. if you're using the standing order, Dr. Terbalizi is the prescriber um, if you're creating prescriptions for that. But again, that standing order is only for the COVID vaccines. Someone is asking about virtual drug manufacturer licensing. Um, the answer to that question is going to depend on what it is that you are specifically doing. Um, it, it's very hard to answer that question in a vacuum without specifically understanding what you are describing or including under that term. So if you can, please reach out to the board office. office. Um, our pharmacy coordinator at pharmacy um, at pr.mo.gov and we'll try to get you an answer as soon as we can. We have a question about the OTC COVID test and getting paid for them and creating, um, if it's going to be paid through an RX or medical benefit, how, how is that done? Um, can, about, can you make a prescription um, for that? Under the PREP Act, the pharmacists have the authority to order tests. So yes, um, you, a pharmacist could do that and create, create a prescription with them being the prescriber. Whether the insurance plans will accept that, I, I, we can't answer that, um, but you, you do have the authority under the PREP Act to order tests. And as I mentioned, there was discussion with health to cre possibly create a standing order to allow pharmacists to do that. And if that occurred, then you would be able to create that prescription under the standing order physician. But at this time, um, we have not heard that there has been a standing order issued. And to clarify, the board rules, uh, Missouri statutes do not prohibit a pharmacist from ordering the test under the authority of HHS's authority under the PREP Act. So we're getting a lot of questions in the office about the board's rules. Um, now billing, as Tom said, is a separate question and insurers or payers may not allow you to um, but the board rules do not prohibit any that authority under the PREP Act. We have someone who says they volunteer at the county health department to do COVID vaccines. Does the state of emergency expiration affect that? No, um, you can still do that. Um, you, you, you wouldn't be able to do it under a protocol. Um, I, I don't know how you're currently doing it there, but I, I would suspect you're probably doing a standing order. Um, but I don't know that. But it does not, it, it might, it does affect if you're using a protocol. Uh, you can't use a protocol to do that anymore. So you need to check where you're getting your authority um, at the health department. Someone is asking about, um, do you need to file a notification of intent to immunize by protocol or by prescription order if you're doing COVID-19 vaccines? So COVID-19 vaccines are not authorized by protocol in the state of Missouri after the expiration of the emergency waiver. So no, you don't need to do a notification of intent um, if you're in, uh, for that because again, you cannot give COVID-19 vaccines by protocol. Um, for um, the NOI for medical order, if you are in, 
administering COVID-19 vaccines under HHS's authority, under the standing order, you do not need to file a notification of intent with the board. Um, someone is asking about pharmacists giving um, vaccines at a clinic that may be run by a local health department. Yes, pharmacists are authorized to administer vaccines outside of a pharmacy. You can. Yeah, that question, I think they uh, further goes on, do they need to specifically cite the PrEP Act? Well, it all depends on wh wh what you're doing there at that clinic. And um, you have the authority under the PrEP Act. Um, you also have the authority under a standing order. Um, you do need to um, determine what, what you are doing because if you're doing the standing order, you need to be following what the standing order says in there that is more, maybe more specific than just the authority under the PREP Act. So um, you do need to determine where your authority comes from to make sure you're following the right guidelines. Someone's asking about remote billing. And again, the board can't provide billing guidance, um, but I think the question, can you do remote billing from out of state? I think it all depends on what um, is involved in the billing. If, if if you're asking, can a technician do that? Um, it would depend on um, if they're doing any data entry into the pharmacy system as part of that billing. Um, I, I, I'm sure there's some billing that doesn't require any of that, but it, it would all go down to specifically what that um, technician is doing. It, that one, that question we probably need more specifics on. It might be better to email the office or an inspector that question. Someone's asking about if they, uh, at the beginning of the year, if they entered um, um, prescriptions um, under their protocol physician and instead of doing the standing order physician, do they have to go back and rebuild them? We can't answer that. Um, you would need to ask, if you're talking about Medicaid, ask Medicaid that question or the PBM um for that um, you technically didn't have the authority to do it under the uh, a protocol physician but um, whether they will require you to rebuild that we, we can't answer that someone's asking a question about re uh, pharmacists doing review they say not final pre product check review so i assume they're asking about data entry review is what i'm going to guess if that's what you're asking for, yes, pharmacists can do um, data entry review remotely under the board's non-dispensing rule. That's um, 6.055. Um, there is some requirements in there, so you should review that rule. Someone's uh, talking about um, they want to know if, if they can dispense oral antivirals I, I don't know if I under, totally understand the question uh, on you say you're outside a healthcare system so I'm not sure how you got the antivirals um, so I don't know if I can answer your question you might want to send that to me in an email separately. Okay, um, we'll wait just a little longer to see if we get any other questions. While we're waiting, we would encourage everyone, if you are not signed up for the board's e-alerts, please visit the board's website. We are sending out a lot of important information via e-alerts right now. Older e-alerts are also available under the board's news publication and resources site on our webpage. Um, there's a lot of good information out there, including on COVID-19 and COVID-19 compliance. So if you haven't signed up already, please do so um, on the board's website. Tom, I don't know if we've gotten any additional questions. Yeah, in. we got one more just came in about when do we renew our intents to administer 
those if, will if you renewed. already have one you, you those are renewed when you do your re, your pharmacist renewal now so you only do them every two years when you renew and it's at during the same time you do the same process when you do that you're asked if you want to renew those so um, it'll be this um, this fall you will renew those again Someone wants to know if Medicaid allows pharmacists to bill COVID vaccines. I, I, you're going to have to ask Medicaid that question. Okay, what? Well, seems like it's going to be it. So we're going to close the question and answer session. And hold on one second. So our next webinar, I don't have a date yet, but uh, Mike Boger, the administrator of BNDD is gonna come in the spring and give us an update. So that'll maybe our next one. I um, don't know for sure. We may have something in between there, but um, we will have uh, BNDD update this year. Um, as I said earlier, our recordings, um, we do record them and put them on our website. Um, these are all the ones we did last year. We had a busy year of webinars last year doing seven of them. So there's the topics. Um, and we did do one on mental uh, well-being, mental health, suicide awareness for pharmacists, um, which was, um, you might want to watch that if you didn't. It was a very good program. Okay, for continuing education, you must complete the post survey. It's going to pop up at the end. So do not close your browser. Um, when I, after I announce I'm closing the webinar, a window will come up um, that says that the organizer has done that. You click close on that. And again, do not close your browser. And then a survey should pop up on your screen. You answer the questions and cl click submit. Should you not get the questions on your screen or you have any other difficulty, you can email us at compliance at pr.mo.gov and ask us for the questions. You must have your answers back to us by email within 24 hours to receive credit. And um, again, we are now emailing certificates out. We no longer mail them. So watch your email um, in the next 30 days for a certificate. Okay, so I want to thank everyone for attending our webinar today, and I'm now going to close it.